how come insulin levels are high when insulin function is low? And the answer is because the receptors for insulin, the proteins that bind insulin on the cells have been downregulated. They are not working as well because there are fewer of them and because the signaling that goes on beyond that receptor is dysfunctional. And that is really what insulin resistance is about. Why does that happen? And it happens in different tissues and it happens for different reasons. And in fact, those different tissues are important in terms of why insulin resistance manifests different diseases. So for instance, type two diabetes is a manifestation of insulin resistance at the level of the liver. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a manifestation of insulin resistance at the ovary. Cardiovascular disease is a manifestation of insulin resistance at the heart. Alzheimer's disease, we are learning, is a manifestation of insulin resistance in the brain. So this phenomenon of insulin resistance is extraordinarily important for all of these chronic diseases, but it's regiospecific. Different tissues manifest insulin resistance at different times. And it is because of that that we end up with these different manifestations. Subcutaneous fat can lead to insulin resistance, but only at a very high level. And so that's one of the reasons why we have metabolically healthy obese people, because they're stuffing energy into subcutaneous fat, but they haven't gotten to the point where those membranes have ruptured. So that's the first way to get insulin resistance. The second way to get insulin resistance is from stress, having nothing to do with energy and having nothing to do with food. And the reason we know this is because patients with endogenous clinical depression who are not eating, I mean, they, have, they are anhedonic. They are, you know, suicidal. You know, you have to admit them to the hospitals to keep them from hurting themselves. You stick them in a scanner and they're not eating, they're losing weight they're losing subcutaneous fat, but they're gaining visceral fat. You can actually see the visceral fat on the CT scan. And in fact, they have insulin resistance too. They have it because of cortisol. They have it because of um, uh, an altered sympathetic nervous system output. They have a different form of insulin resistance which is not necessarily food driven, not necessarily energy driven, but rather hormonally driven, like we see in patients with Cushing syndrome. And then finally, the third group, the patients with liver fat. Now, I just saw that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is 45% of the American population and 25% of the world's population, having nothing to do with obesity. And this is true throughout the entire world. One quarter of all the people on the planet, two billion adults, have fatty liver disease. Now, prior to 1980, if you had fatty liver disease, you were an alcoholic. But these are not alcoholics. We don't have 2 billion alcoholics. So why do they have liver fat? And why is the liver fat generating the insulin resistance? And the reason is because the liver is the primary target of insulin action. And so when your liver cells start accumulating fat, they don't work very well. And so your pancreas has to make extra insulin to make the liver do its job. And so I think that the liver is really ground zero for why we have this phenomenon of insulin resistance. And that's why you can be thin and insulin resistant, as well as being fat and insulin resistant. So we're taught, you know, I mean, just from conventional medical education on nutrition and metabolism, that there's really not a specific macronutrient. It's just an excess amount of calories. And uh, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> Yes. And I want you to just kind of quickly overview, because it would be another, you know, three part series of 
how, for example, sugar or fructose, uh, 100 grams of or 200 grams of calories from sugar or fructose has a different effect on the liver than, for example, protein or or fat. Um, and, and, you know, just explain how, you know, redox control in the liver and, and, you know, just, just some basic hepatic physiology of, of handling these things. Well, for the audience, look, you've been pelted for the last 50 years with calories. Okay. It's all about calories, calories in, calories out. And therefore it's about two behaviors, gluttony and sloth. And so. If you're fat, it's your fault, you know, and therefore diet and exercise, you know, ultimately all of these are the mantras of the food industry. And the reason is because if it's about calories, it's your problem, not theirs. It's their way of assuaging their culpability for what they, you know, are putting into ultra processed foods. And you have to understand that there's an entire literature that basically pushes back against this notion of calories. So let me give you some examples. Number one, there are countries that are diabetic without being obese, and there are countries that are obese without being diabetic. So obesity and diabetes don't necessarily play the same role. Number two, um, obesity is growing at the rate of 2.78% per year worldwide but diabetes is growing at the rate of 4.07% per year worldwide. If diabetes was just because of obesity, how come diabetes is going up faster? Number three, if you look at the rate of increase in diabetes in the general population of the United States, it's going up just as fast in the obese as it is in the normal weight population. If obesity was the reason, that wouldn't be the case. Number four, there are two diseases that we as pediatric endocrinologists take care of that I want to alert you to. One of them is called Lerone dwarfism. Now, Lerone dwarfism is a defect in growth hormone signaling. There is a founder effect group of Lerone dwarfs in Ecuador, and they're known as the Little Women of Loja, and they were written up in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the reason was because, number one, they're very short, but they're also very obese. And the reason is because they can't lift fat out of their fat cells because of the fact that their growth hormone doesn't work. Okay. So these Little Women of Loja should be very sick, shouldn't they? Turns out they get zero diabetes and they get zero cancer, whereas their wild type relatives all get diabetes and cancer. So they are fat and they're healthy. Whereas their relatives who don't have the growth hormone signaling defect are all thin and sick. So just being obese doesn't make you sick. All right. And there is a disease on the other side called lipodystrophy. So these people can't put fat into fat cells because they don't have it. They don't have the fat cells to do it. So they end up having to take excess energy and put it into fat in their muscles and in their liver. And so they have the worst diabetes of all, even though they don't even have any fat stores. So in each of these cases, it's not about how fat you are. It's not about the calories. It's not about the obesity. So the notion that calories are the cause of type 2 diabetes just has to be stricken. That is not what's going on. Yes, no question, fat in the wrong places, definitely the problem. And yes, your food contributes to that. But it's not because of calories per se. Because not every calorie is the same. 